Thanks for joining us today. I'm Helen Jung. I'm the opinion editor with the Oregonian, um, and we're meeting with candidates for House District 50. Uh, also, Laura Gunderson is um, on the call. Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi there. My name is Laura Gunderson. I am Director of Public Interest and Accountability at the Oregonian. That basically means I oversee our newsroom reporters, and I also serve on the editorial board. Great. Um, thanks so much. I think what we'll do is just have each of you introduce yourselves and give us a, a one or two minute uh, um, overview of why you're running and why voters should choose you. And let's start, let's go in alphabetical, alphabetical order. So William, would you mind going first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity to talk about our candidacy uh, and the reasons why we're running to be the state representative of House District 50. Um, for the record, my name is William Miller and I'm running to serve as the state representative of House District 50, which is Gresham and parts of East Portland. Uh, I'm running for many reasons and the biggest reason is because of my lived experience. Growing up, my family lived in poverty, living paycheck to paycheck, barely making ends meet uh, and just struggling to get by. Um, and, and, you know, flash forwarding uh, beyond that, my father died of an opioid overdose in 2006. Uh, and a short year later, my brother was murdered over a drug deal in Southwest Portland. So I've seen the harmful impacts time and time again of what uh, drug use and abuse does to a family and to a community. Um, and I currently have two siblings who are addicted to drugs. So I'm witnessing on a daily basis the struggles that they have faced and continue to face with lack of access and opportunity to get clean and sober. Um, Beyond that, you know, I, I'm a, I've been a victim of sexual violence, um, and and so I know the the, the deep rooted issues in our community, um, and and ones that our community face day in and day out. Uh, I've worked uh, the I've worked in in public health. I've worked at the legislative level, so I have not just deep lived experience, but deep. Uh, professional experience as well, uh, passing meaningful legislation such as the Reproductive Health Equity Act uh, and working at the local level to work on the Community Health Improvement Plan with the county, which is now uh, guiding policy and framework. Um, but I have deep lived experience, deep professional experience, which has allowed me the opportunity to pass dozens of meaningful pieces of legislation that impacts not just those in East County, but those all throughout Oregon. That's what makes me the best candidate. Uh, I'm able to uh, hit the ground running. Salem needs a leader and Gresham needs a leader who's able to do that, um, not someone to come into Salem and learn how to be a legislator. And I'm able to do that, hit the ground running. Great, thanks very much. Um, I believe Therese Bottomley has just joined on. Uh, Therese, do you wanna int introduce yourself real quick? Hi, Therese Bottomley, editor of the Oregonian Oregon Live. Thanks for taking the time. Um, great. Um, and now, Ricky, would you um, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running? Of course. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Ricky Ruiz. Uh, full name is Ricardo Ruiz Madrigal. Uh, I am, uh, was born in Portland, raised in Gresham. I've been a lifelong Gresham resident, living in the city of Gresham for 25 years, and specifically coming out of the neighborhood of Rockwood, which is one of the most challenged, but yet diverse and most beautiful neighborhoods in the state of Oregon. Uh, one of the things that I want to share with all of you is the fact that, you know, as a, a community advocate for many years, as a elected official, been, been elected already twice, uh, being elected in the Reynolds School Board on 2017 as the youngest school board member at age 22, uh, getting reelected again on 2019 to serve my first full term. Uh, as a city employee, being working for the city of Gresham for five years, bringing the government experience, bringing the local advocacy experience, bringing the elected office experience, and of course the lived experience make me the best candidate for state representative for House District 50. Uh, I also grew up in poverty. I grew up in the, under the line of poverty. Uh, my family and I would always struggle to make, uh, uh, to pay for rent, to pay for food. Uh, we faced many eviction threats throughout our, our life living in Rockwood. Uh, my parents both immigrated from uh, Mexico in the 1980s. So the fear of, of safety, the fear of us being separated uh, was, was very, really, very real growing up. And I know for a fact this still continues to be very real for many of our families across the state and across the nation. Um, one of the things that I want to really push for uh, as a state representative is be able to advocate for education, 
be able to make sure, making sure the number one thing that we do is continue to keep our students success money in our schools for our students. And if COVID-19 continues to be uh, a thing in the next couple of months and if not years, we want to make sure we equip our students with the needed resources in order for them to have an equitable distance learning experience. Uh, same thing, supports for our teachers, supports for uh, uh, mental health supports for our students and continue the advocacy because I, I, I went through the public education system. Uh, it failed many of my friends, it almost failed me. Uh, and now it's time for us to invest in stuff in, in our next generation, in our next future. And I'm 25 years old, but I already feel like I'm not. I, I, and, and I wanna make sure that I'm leaving this state better than when I came in. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll just start off with questions and we'll alternate. And so Ricky, if you wouldn't mind going first on this one. Um, it's unknown just how much the pandemic and the stay home order will cost the state in tax revenue or how long and how deeply the economic impacts will cut. Can you give a couple of ideas of what you think the legislature should do next to help individuals and businesses get through this economic crisis? Of course, I think uh, as a legislature, I think the 2021 legislation is going to be one of the most important legislations uh, in the modern time era. Uh, one of the things that we need to do as a state and be able to include everybody uh, is to have to really foresee our, all our options uh, and really figure out what is the best case and what is the best option that we have. What are the best options that we have as a state? Uh, there's no question that uh, our small businesses or our, and our economic system across the state is really uh, suffering from COVID-19. And we need to find a creative way to urge our federal government to be able to continue to vouch for our states, urge our state government as well to continue to push uh, loans and continue to push resources for small businesses, uh, for organizations, for municipalities, uh, and, and overall, uh, organizations that are doing the work uh, in, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in all the jurisdictions. Uh, one of the things that I think that we shouldn't do is uh, be able to do any additional cuts to public employee pension benefits. Uh, you know, we had to be innovative. We had to look at the data and really figure out what's the best way to problem solve moving forward. Um, and sacrifices have to be made, you know. I think that's, that's gonna be a tough conversation as we move forward. Um, I was looking at the revenue forecast and it's not looking too good for, for the state of Oregon. So one of the things that we need to figure out is if we, we, if we need to invest in something, we have to make sure where we're cutting from. Uh, and obviously I don't want us to be cutting from anything. If, any, if in contrast, I think it's very important for us to continue to invest in these programs that we already started and introduce new ones as well. So, um, uh, okay. Um, I guess actually we'll we'll kind of come to that that question a little bit later as well. Um, William, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? Um, sure. Okay. Um, it's unknown just how much the pandemic and the stay home order will cost the state in tax revenue, and how long or deep how deeply the economic impacts will cut. Can you give a couple ideas of what you think the legislature should do next to help individuals and businesses get through this economic crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I, I continue to, to be on the ground hearing of, of these issues um, time and time again in community in my full time job working as the advocacy manager at the Native American Youth and Family Center. So outreach and engagement of community, small business development, pros prosperity has really been at the forefront of the conversations I, I've had as of late. Our businesses are suffering. Our communities are hurting. Are hurting. Um, there's lack of food security, a lack of stable housing. We need to make sure we're investing and being forward thinking and visionary well beyond the 2021 legislative session by protecting and increasing small business support and development. Um, beyond that, supporting those who are at risk or vulnerable of losing housing. I know Measure 26210 uh, is hopeful to get at that, uh, which is the Metro uh, Housing and Homelessness Bond that'll be on the ballot next month as well. Um, but we got to think bigger picture, working with our partners statewide and, and federally to make sure that we have the dollars needed to invest. Uh, one such way is continuing to hold our corporate partners accountable. Um, our corporate partners need to pay their fair share by investing back into community. 
Additionally, um, I, you know, as much as I enjoy my own micro brews, beer and wine taxes haven't been increased since the 1970s. There's additional revenue that we can pull from there. And then I think the third, the third point is making sure we reevaluate the, the Oregon kicker. Um, if we were to put the kicker to unfunded actual liabilities, we would have more money to pull from in order to invest and safeguard these protections for our community. That's what we need to do. And Salem needs to provide bold action uh, now and moving forward. We've seen out of, you know, just last week, the, the Legislative Emergency Board um, gave millions of dollars to the Oregon Worker Relief Fund by protecting those who are, are vulnerable and not covered under the CARES Act or not covered under current state funding uh, by, protect, pr by providing additional funding to communities who might be impacted by um, immigration status. So we need to keep thinking in that line uh, of thought and be visionary as we approach this economic crisis that we're, we're stepping into. Great, thank you. And actually you um, kind of segued already into my next question. I don't know if you'll have a lot more to, to, uh, that you wanna go into detail on that, but even with federal assistance, Oregon's needs will far outstrip the revenue it brings in. Um, what if any changes to Oregon's tax system would you support to bring in more revenue or from different sources? You named a few, I, I don't know if there are, there are others you would also add in? Yeah, I definitely, you know, my, my top three right now is focusing on how we can make sure our corporate partners are, are being accountable to providing an equitable and fair uh, community that we live in so all people can thrive. Uh, and then looking at our, our sin taxes and how we can re reevaluate those. I know that the tobacco tax is on the ballot in November, so we'll see how that fares. But um, looking at how we can uh, buy down our unfunded actual liabilities for the public employee retirement system to ensure we have more free money to invest in these programs to safeguard these protections. So I think I'd start with those three, but Oregon needs to be innovative and creative as we move forward. Okay. And along those same lines, there's been some, um, uh, some efforts or some lobbying by businesses to delay implementation of the corporate activity tax. Um, is that something you would support or no? No, you know, our, our educational system, our schools, our teachers uh, are long overdue for this investment. I don't think a delay is needed or, or you know, if, if it did happen, it would really disenfranchise our communities by providing unique opportunities for enrichment and educational experiences. So the investment is now, the investment is needed, and I would not support a delay. Great, thank you. Um, and Ricky, the uh, question for you is, um, even with federal assistance, Oregon's needs will far outstrip the revenue it brings in. What, if any, changes to Oregon's tax system would you support to bring in more revenue or to bring it from different sources? Yeah, <clears throat> well, one of the things that I think we all can probably agree on is, um, is being able to push uh, our multimillionaire corporations to pay the fair share. Uh, and I can't express enough how uh, if they were to pay the fair share, we would be in a better place. We could have been in a better place years ago. And uh, we wouldn't have to be able to advocate for student success money last year or the year before if that was already in place uh, from the beginning. Um, and, like, and I think one of the things, too, we have to really evaluate all our options and figure out uh, what's the best case, uh, what can work best for everybody. Uh, you know, there is uh, a lot of my constituents, uh, are, are, I don't know who's doing this, but they're uh, falsifying information around the sales tax. And one of the things that I want to mention, and I keep telling uh, my constituents and my, and my people is letting them know, like, the importance of why the sales tax is not a good idea. Uh, because uh, it imposes uh, a tax on on, on on everything you buy at a store or a grocery store, but the people who get mostly... Uh, damage from this are low-income families or, or families and individuals who are in poverty. Um, so uh, one, one of the things that, that I think we need to be focusing on and really pushing forward is being able to get a corporate tax on tax and be able to uh, figure out a way to be re reevaluate the kicker as well uh, and then introduce uh, a, a, a more progressive uh, income tax as well uh, and where um, depending how much money you make, that's how much taxes uh, you, you will have to pay. Uh, and right now, I think we have, we, and our rate is about 9%. Um, 
and we have to kind of figure out and again so again have all these options available and really figure out what's the best way to uh, for us as a state to to not be economically economically damaged moving forward past 2021 and moving forward so let me ask you in terms of um i mean the the biggest differentiator in business taxes between oregon and other states is that oregon doesn't have a sales tax that mm. you have you're losing out on businesses the the amount that uh that would be paid for buying um uh just from other businesses for instance um not to mention the out-of-state income that comes from tourists etc um you know there and there's certainly arguments about how to construct a, a sales tax that doesn't hit food, medicine, et cetera. Um, but that is still something, even though that is still something that you would, you would not support. Well, I think it's, we all have, we have, like you said, I think we have to have all the options available and really involve the community and letting them know this is something that we're looking into. Uh, I just, I, I remember, I just, I just know sales tax have been very detrimental to our low income families who have already, already have enough to go buy stuff, but, um, if there is a progressive way of doing a sales tax, uh, I think it's worth having the conversation. Okay. And would you support delaying um, uh, collection of the um, corporate activity tax? Absolutely not. Um, you know, I was in the front lines of, of protesting with our, our teachers unions when we were trying to fight for this in Salem. Uh, as a school board member, uh, we, we, we really are struggling and, and, and I, I've been in the school district as a school member for three years in the wrong school district, which is one of the most, uh, quote unquote, can say one of the challenging school districts in the state of Oregon. And one of the issues that we continue to have is lack of educational funding. Uh, the, it's long overdue. Our students are rare, have been depending on it ever since I was a student, you know, uh, we've been depending on the, our teachers depend on it. I think. Uh, provide those that those resources are able are going to able to provide mental health supports that our students need. If distance learning continues to happen, we have to make sure that we're uh, using those. We have to use those funds in an equitable way to to provide the resources that students and families need to continue educational learning. Uh, and uh, I guess our education system has been in the in the in the, in the in the end of getting cuts years after years, you know, for over 30 years, they've been getting cuts year after year, after biennium, after biennium. And I think it's time for us as education advocate to keep that and be sure to uh, use the student success money in a transparent and effective way. Okay. Um, I would like to jump into an education question before, uh, I, I know that the others have some questions as well, but um, you know, you, you talked about uh, cuts over the, the past, and I guess you would be first on this, over the past 30 years. Um, you know, in, in the past several biennia, the, the actual amount that has increased. Um, it, you know, the, the issue is in terms of like um, increased uh, personnel costs, specifically pension related costs, as well as healthcare costs. So, you know, knowing that Oregon has had trouble um, you know it's it's got a low graduation rate it has mm -hmm. a high chronic absenteeism rate what's what's going wrong what what is Oregon why is Oregon not doing better in helping particularly students of color um, but all its students um, achieve better outcomes yeah I think as a school board member I can speak to this and say that it really comes down to school district school district practices uh, and, and I think the state has to kind of have, be the example of how uh, we're using the resources. I think one of the things that I figured out at the beginning of my school board um, career is how, how disproportionately we were suspending students of color, how disproportionately we were, uh, students of color were getting in trouble more often in counterparts to their white uh, classmates. And uh, that data has gone down because we've been calling it out. And I think it takes uh, community leaders to run for those positions and be able to advocate for those things because uh, it all comes down to school district practices and, and really trying to shape that into a new way and making sure that we're providing the wraparound services with the resources that we already have and making sure that we keep our students safe, we keep our students on track and making sure that they, the end goal is for them to graduate and, and one of the things that I've also been pushing for is uh, providing mentorship support to those students from the beginning. You know, we have a couple organizations, but one of them who's doing a really amazing job is an organization that we were able to recruit from Portland called Family, Family of Friends Mentoring. Uh, and that mentorship program has been 
uh, on, on, the, on the ground, mentoring students from elementary all the way to middle school. And if the students want to continue into high school, they continue into high school as well. Um, and providing that mentorship, mentorship support. You know, I, there's a large amount of families out in, in, in the rental school district and maybe across the state of Oregon as well that are coming from single family parenting, uh, that don't have housing stability, that don't have financial stability. Food security is a big issue as well. Transportation is a big issue. And as, and as, as a school district, we can only do so much with the resources that we have. And I saw this as a student uh, being me part of the rental school district from 99 to 2012. Uh, and I still see those challenges to this day. But one of the things that we've done in, the school, in, our, in Reynolds is that our graduations are going up. Our graduation rate is going up. Uh, it's not in the place that you know, that it's not yet in the place that it should be, but we're moving pieces together. And I think I can't express enough how important it is that uh, school district practices need to change. And it takes, uh, in my opinion, former students who went through that process, who went through that, um, who went through that experience to come to a school district and come to a school board and make those changes. Great, thank you. Um, Williams, uh, the same question for you. Um, Oregon's educational system is known, unfortunately, for its low graduation rate and high chronic absenteeism. Um, why, you know, considering that, that funding has actually increased over the past few biennia, why is Oregon not uh, making ground or making up ground for students of color as well as improving the outcomes for all its students? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think this is a multiple pronged approach. I don't think it's a one size fits all. And I think that we can approach it at the legislative level uh, by instituting good policy and systems change with the Oregon Department of Education. You know, I think the first and the biggest thing is we need to recognize that not uh, that standardized testing doesn't work for everyone. Uh, I went to the Reynolds School District, uh, graduated from the Reynolds School District, and I had the unique opportunity to attend the Reynolds High School and the Reynolds Learning Academy uh, to get individualized attention. And standardized testing never worked for me. Um, all through college, I was not a good tester. And, and studies show that, that you know, people grow in different ways uh, other than measuring someone's success via standardized testing. So I think we need to look at that model. Um, secondly, a lot of our communities live in fear, whether it be uh, and, and specifically communities of color. You know, I'm, I'm Native American, I'm Cherokee and Blackfeet from Oklahoma and Montana. And I can speak to, to the communities I live and serve. Uh, there's a disconnect in relationships from school districts to cultural competency and understanding of cultural practices. Uh, we have fought hard in the past with local school districts like Reynolds School District, uh, David Douglas School District to make sure that our youth graduating can just wear an eagle feather. Uh, on their cap and gown. So literally, it's small steps that make a big difference in someone's life. Uh, I have two nieces who are currently in the Reynolds School District, and I can tell you that that from past experience, they, they've they been absent from school because of fear. Um, fear of getting beat up or fear of, you know, um, um, getting in fights. And um, the they've changed schools as a result because um, the, the district has chosen not to do anything. And that's, a, that's an increased fear, not just in the district, but in many districts throughout Oregon. So we need to address fear, we need to address cultural relevancy and competency, but also make sure that our youth and, and our educators have the tools necessary to, to, to thrive, whether that be, oh, let's get you additional food, let you, let's get you additional housing opportunities, because we need, we need to come together as a community and fully embrace each and every one of these students in order for them to be successful. Great, thank you very much. Um, did uh, Laura or Therese, do one of you want, <clears throat> want to ask a question? Yes, I do. I just had to find that, the mute button, thank you. Analysts warned that the legislature's decision to delay repayment of the pension system's $25 billion unfunded liability would put the fund at greater risk in the event of a recession. Well, stocks have plummeted and we are almost certainly in a recession now. What, if anything, do you think we should do to tackle this public finance crisis? And, and to clarify, you know, I'm talking about Oregon's PER system and moving forward, not necessarily going back to benefits back in time, but on any type of benefit change or reform moving forward. 
And Helen, help me, I, I've forgotten. It goes to William first. William. Thank yeah, you. thank you for that question. And that that's a big question in many ways. You know, I think that safeguarding the protections of our, our public employees retirement system is really important. And in fact, last session, I, I worked against that bill. I did not want that bill to pass. I thought it was uh, not a good bill for those who've worked so hard for themselves to protect their futures. Um, but I'll go back to, to sort of my introduction and mention the need to reevaluate the Oregon kicker. I think that if we were to reevaluate the Oregon kicker and put it toward our unfunded actual liabilities, we could see um, better investments in our PERS system and an increased opportunity to, to provide funding in other programmatic areas, departments, et cetera. But I think it starts there. I don't think we need to be taking uh, away in employees or, or individuals' retirements. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. What I agree with is finding a comprehensive way to restructure this system. However, I know that we're bound by Supreme Court decisions. So um, we need to just be progressive and forward thinking in ways that that we can um, buy this unfunded actual liabilities down. And Ricky, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. That was a, yes. It's a long one. <laughs> it's a long one. Analysts, <laughs> analysts warned that the legislature's decision to delay repayment of the pension system's $25 billion unfunded liability would put the fund at greater risk in the event of a recession. Well, now here we are and stocks have plummeted. We're almost certainly in a recession now. What, if anything, do you think we should do to tackle this public finance crisis? And again, to clarify, we're talking about Oregon PERS and uh, we're talking about benefits going forward, not going back in time to adjust what people have been given, but making changes or reforms to adjust what is uh, provided in the future. You know, I think, yeah, it's a loaded question, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, I think we are, like I said uh, prior to, to this question, I think we're gonna have to consider all our options. And to pull us through COVID-19 and moving forward and the post-pandemic economic recovery period. Uh, but I don't think we should or can fill Oregon's financial hole by making any additional uh, cuts to public employee pensions benefits. Uh, we are going to have to uh, be innovative, uh, data-driven problem solvers, and having the knowledge that sacrifices will have to be made uh, moving forward. I think my goal as a legislator will be to assure that all choices uh, that are being made are made with knowledge and transparency and all sectors of our economy and workforce, our community is well represented. Uh, you know, as someone who comes from a, who's gonna soon represent a district with the highest, one of the highest poverty rates in the state of Oregon, I'm nearly aware that the existing significant uh, disparities in the distribution of state and local government resources are very um, lopsided and that must change. Um, you know, to truly recover uh, from COVID and the coming recession, I think we already are in the, in the recession, is that we have to embrace all the possibilities uh, as possible and make sure that we examine whether our existing systems and programs are really working for us. We need to approach it like this is like, we're one Oregon family uh, and families that are always in times of children and family members need their help uh, more than ever. Uh, you know, I think our priorities will have to consist of economic, economic recovery that puts people and small businesses first uh, and protecting our most vulnerable people and communities first as well. I guess just to follow up on that, I think a lot of people would say PERS is not working for us, not because it's the employee's fault, but because it was uh, a system built on a foundation that just couldn't last. So we get to this point. Um, if we don't do anything about it, the money will continue to come out of classrooms and for services. So mm -hmm. I think we're already here. So how do we address a program then that we know is not working? And um, if we don't do anything about it, we'll continue to have pains in the places that you've said, and you know, also William said this too, um, that you care most about. Well, I, <clears throat> I agree with, with what Will said, and I think both of us can agree to this, that we need to evaluate what the kicker uh, and be figured out how we can perhaps use those funds to um, uh, help with the with the purse situation. Um, I'm getting more familiar with the purse situation as well, and I've been seeing the, kind of the effects from our school district. And I think for us in, in the Reynolds School District, there's going there's going to be a huge increase uh, that is going to come out out of our budget because of the purse. Uh, and it's not it is not the employees' fault, you know, and it's not certainly our fault. It's 
I think uh, it also, it also, it's all kind of come down to being able to kind of have these transparent conversations and really trying to figure out what systems work, what systems don't work. And I'm still reading on that. And it's a lot of stuff that, a lot of stuff in the Oregon history that I have to read through still uh, and decisions that were made in prior legislation sessions uh, and really trying to figure out how we as a community can, can move forward. And I don't know if there's always there's going to be one specific thing that we can do to fix the per situation, but I think it's going to come down to a lot of small changes that we make in the state. Well, and I have a question, unless Helen, did you want to nope, go follow ahead. up? Okay. Um, kind of talking about bringing people to the table and having transparent conversations. Um, in Oregon, the Republican walkout this session uh, provided what was probably the most dramatic evidence of a partisan divide. The split between Democrats and Republicans has been apparent and growing deeper for years. What, if anything, would you do to help bring sides together? And Ricky, I think I'll start with you. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I think we have to come, we have to go into the legislation knowing that we have to have two different relationships. One being a legislative relationship and one being a personal relationship. Uh, you know, I have several of my friends who are Republicans and are in, in the legislation who are Republicans. And I had those conversations with them and trying to figure out what the, situ what, what the problem was. Um, you know, I think for, you know, as, as looking at the history, you know, there's 70 percent of the bills, over 70 percent of the bills that are passed in the state of Oregon are come from bipartisan support. So uh, it, there is connection there. I think it comes down to elected new leaders, new generation of leaders that are willing to have those counterpart conversations with Republicans uh, and being able to uh, really f come down to knowing that we are we're all one being Oregon and we need to have, we're going to disagree. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be agreements. There's going to be celebrations. And uh, we have to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to support our state. Um, you know, I, when, when the walkout happened, obviously it was something that I was very disappointed to see. I was very, uh, I was angry to see that because all our hard work uh, was basically thrown out. Uh, and we should not be in any position to do that ever again, whether it's from the Republican side or the democratic side. Uh, we need to, we are elected to represent, we are elected to show up, we are elected to do the work, and we're elected to debate whether we disagree or, or, or agree. Uh, and having that said, I think it's changing the, the energy of, the, of Salem, bringing in new people, uh, and making sure that we have that understanding from the beginning. William, would you like me to read that question again? No, I think I got it. Um, thank you for asking. You know, I think that um, I always draw back to my 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 ancestors' ties and and traditional values of um, making sure you have an established relationship with community and with folks before you conduct business. And that's how I've operated and continue to operate both in and outside of Salem. Uh, the past two legislative session at, sessions, I was in Salem when they didn't show up for work. Um, pushing a legislative agenda which impacts all Oregonians. And last session to see all of our pieces of legislation die uh, was, was awful. Um, and polarization is literally crippling our state. So we need to make sure we're approaching common ground, uh, making sure we're building unique uh, and prosperous relationships with one another. I have friendships uh, on all sides of the aisle um, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side with, with legislators and uh, legislative staff. And I think that's what is needed to get the job done. Uh, find common ground. Let's, let's figure out a, a, a solution together. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that everything I, I will propose as a state representative will be the best idea. That's why we need conversation, uh, open and honest conversation to get this work done and represent our people to the best of our ability. So, um, you know, going in this with, with the understanding that polarization is not our friend, rather it's our enemy, and we need to make sure we're, we're doing good service and being the best representation uh, for the folks we represent. Great, thank you very much. Um, Let's see, I guess this goes to uh, William. And do you prefer Will or William? I'm sorry, I should have asked before. It either, Will works. Okay, great. Um, would you support moving forward with a cap and trade program in the 2021 session? 
Yes. Yeah. So I, I supported the cap and trade the past two legislative sessions. However, you know, protecting our climate and our, our um, ecosystem, if you will, is literally one of the most crucial pieces of legislation we will vote on in our lifetime. If we're not protecting our climate, our environment, our way, our waterways, we, no other piece of legislation will ever matter because we won't have a place to call home. Uh, I've been endorsed by the Oregon League of Conservated Voters and Sunrise Movement um, as an environmental champion in this, in this fight. Uh, but I do want to make sure we're safeguarding and protect, uh, protecting uh, uh, good economic jobs in this process. So I don't, I don't want to lose sight of that. I want to make sure that our community still flourishes while we're able to protect the environment. Uh, so yes, I would support a cap and trade piece of legislation in the 2021 session. Great. And Ricky, same question for you. Would you support moving forward with cap and trade in 2021? Absolutely. Um, I was upset that they didn't pass sooner, but if, <clears throat> if elected to be in chair representative, I will fight and I, and I can agree more. I think uh, uh, we can, we have so many great, I have so many great ideas moving forward as a future legislator, but if we don't address our climate uh, crisis, that might not even happen. Uh, I think we need a plan to live on. Uh, we need to invest in renewable energy solutions. That way money can stay in Oregon and expand our economy, uh, expands jobs, uh, green efficient jobs for our, our Oregonians as well. And one of the things that I want to move forward with as well is, you know, we need to change our state goals uh, for economy-wide uh, reduction on uh, Oregon's greenhouse emissions uh, to net zero by 2050 and at least 50% reduction by the year 2035. Uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of amazing work with uh, Renew Oregon, who are also uh, champions and great advocates of climate uh, climate justice in the state of Oregon. Uh, Oregon Leader Conservation Borders is also, I've been part of their work as well, and, and they're supporting our campaign. Uh, so one of the things that, you know, I, there's no question about it. I think we need to uh, get get this cap and trade bill passed without worrying about anybody walking out in order to kill that bill and all the bills moving forward. We need to have these conversations with our counterparts and really look at why this is important and why Oregon needs this sooner than later. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, I do have another question here. Hold on just a second. And this goes to uh, Ricky. How independent from your party will you be and, you know, for example, are there any votes in the past few legislative sessions you can think about in which you had a, you would have voted against the majority of your party? Um, yeah, if you can kind of just talk a little bit about independence and, and if you have any specific examples, that would be great. Well, I don't I don't think of it as being independent. I think uh, I will rely on my party to learn how to how to be a good Democratic legislator in my house district. Uh, but one of the most recent things that I disagreed with was the purse vote. Uh, you know, I went out of my way to call my senator, to call my representative, and making sure, letting know how important that voting uh, for that bill, how, how important it was to not vote for that bill. And um, and obviously, it didn't go that way. Um, and uh, and a lot of our unions, a lot of our public employees uh, saw that. And I'm a public employee, uh, and. Uh, I work with public employees, and, and that's why all of them, almost all of them, are supporting our campaign for state representative. And that's one of the things that I disagreed with, it, and I feel like if I was a representative at that time, I would rather attain the consequences of the Democratic Party than to betray the people that voted me in into the legislation. Uh, uh, but I, I, still, I still trust the Democratic Party for them to do the, the right thing for our state. Um, you know, a lot of them, a lot of current legislators who are Democrats are, I see them as friends and I see them as mentors. Um, and some of them voted for it, some of them voted against it. And um, it's one of those things in where, you know, I, I want to I wanna align with democratic values. I want to make sure that we are doing everything that we can for our working class, for our low income families and for our Oregonians in general. Uh, but if there's any any situation where we're going against all the values, which are also my personal values that my parents gave to me from the beginning, uh, that's where I will I'll probably look somewhere else and just be a little bit independent from that. But I, you know, I, with the, with the purse situation, the purse vote, that's one thing that I was against. 
and that was one thing that a lot of my democratic um uh, a lot of democratic legislators uh did not care about mm -hmm. okay um and will yeah i would also i would also say the most recent thing that that i would have voted um, not by not not on party line, so to speak, or with my caucus, is um, Senate Bill 1049, which is the Public Employees Retirement System, um, in the the 2019 legislative long session. And I, you know, I was there advocating against against that vote, um, but we all know how that turned out. I think it just continues to do a, a disservice to the communities and um, chips away at the fundamental economic security. Uh, and foundation of of Oregonians, and so um, I would have I would have broken away uh, and not voted to support that piece of legislation during during that session. Okay, great. Um, and then my last question is just about uh, campaign finance reform. Um, the Supreme Court uh, came out with their decision just this week regarding uh, uh, allowing uh, limits on campaign donations contributions. Um, I'm wondering just in your view, and this goes first to Will, uh, what kinds of limits do you think are appropriate and on whom would you impose them? Corporations, individuals, unions, who else? Or who, who of those would you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a, a really great question. And I, I think that, that the, the, the decision by the Supreme Court is a good decision. We need comprehensive campaign finance reform in order for people, uh, your average ordinary person who's not familiar with our political system, uh, for them to get elected, for them to run and win a seat. Uh, it, I don't believe that our election systems should be bought by unions, should be bought by corporations. I believe that our, elect our elections should be um, paid for by individuals like you and I, uh, in order to see our community members uplifted and thriving. Um, that's what my campaign has run on, is, is, is not, not necessarily union donations, more so people-powered donations, community-driven. Um, and, and I think that, that putting limitations on our unions, our corporate partners, um, to, to essentially buy an election, I don't agree with. Um, I, I think that we need a comprehensive uh, campaign finance reform in order to allow more people like like myself to run for office. Great, thank you. Um, and Ricky, same question for you. Um, uh, what kind of, do you support uh, limiting campaign contributions and uh, what types of limits and in what manner would you see them, uh, would you support them being um, imposed? Yeah, I completely support it. I think um, if you want to have, if you want to continue to see uh, POC uh, future candidates that want to run for office, I think the best way to do that is be able to have elections that are publicly funded, uh, elections that are funded by the people uh, instead of corporations uh, and all these millionaire uh, businesses that are existing out there. Um, well, I think one of the things that I would want to see is putting a campaign limit on everybody, $500. Um, that way uh, it stays steady and, and people are able to afford it. Um, I think one of the most important parts here as well is uh, being able to be transparent where the money is coming from uh, and making sure that we track that and, and ensure that there's no money that is coming from places that it shouldn't be. Um, and I, I, I think also, I think if, 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 if people want to elect a, a homegrown leader, uh, the money has to come from that same community. Uh, from that same state. Um, so I, I would also put input the limit on out-of-state funding, out-of-country funding. I know it's already a thing, but out-of-state donations uh, should be looked at and be able to, we should put a limit to that as well because there's no person that, there's no people that, if people are living out-of-state and, and they're putting their, fun, their resources on a campaign that is running Gresham or running Fairview or running Southwest Portland, uh, that's kind of a little bit of a worrisome. So making sure that uh, campaign contributions are coming from the same district, from the same state is very important. Great, thank you. Um, Therese or Laura, do either of you have any more questions? Nope, I'm good, thank you. Great. I think I'm good too, thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you very much for uh, spending time with us. Do, are there any um, other priorities you wanted to, to highlight before we end this call? 
and I think that would go first to uh, Ricky. Yeah, I, one of the, one of the things that I really uh, want to continue to push for, I, I can't express enough, is education, our healthcare system right now. I think uh, our, we are seeing that our healthcare systems has been have been broken uh, across the nation, and give, with this pandemic that we're currently living on, we really need to invest and prepare for a future pandemic that we're, we, we, we don't know if it's going to happen in five years, 10 years, or 100 years. We have to make sure that all our states are well equipped with the, with the needed resources in the healthcare system. Uh, our housing is also a big, a big thing, a big part of our platform, making sure that we are continuing to, to expand affordable housing and continuing to invest in our voucher program, which allows families to obtain a voucher without having them to move to an affordable housing unit that's in the corner of the city with there is no transportation, no grocery store, nor healthcare clinic nearby. Uh, our environment, I can't express enough. I think we had to pass a cap and trade bill in 2021 and making sure that we have a, a planet that we can live on, uh, making sure that we are investing in our small business economy, making sure we're finding ways in where our economy is staying here in Oregon, that way it can flourish and grow as we, um, move forward and, and post COVID-19. And one of the things that I'm very passionate about is immigration as well and keeping our families together, making sure we continue to invest in a worker relief fund where our immigrant uh, and undocumented uh, residents and families who are still paying federal tax or paying local tax and state tax somehow some way do not qualify for the stimulus check or unemployment. Uh, and that's something that we need to continue to invest as well and making sure that we keep our families together. No person should be detained, no person should be separated from their families and no children or no adults should be, should be placed in a cage uh, for them to be there for a long time. We need, to, we need to really address that and really have an immigration reform move forward. Great, thank you. And William, uh, Will, any other uh, priorities you wanted to highlight? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm running on four tenants of what I think that uh, those in, in Gresham really need. So access to education, increased educational opportunities, safe and affordable housing, um, and which, which is really at the crux of social determinants of health, uh, if you boil it down. The third is, is mental health and addiction services, increased access to those areas. And then the fourth is criminal justice reform. You know, it's no secret that that too many black and brown people are jailed at a higher rate than any, any other uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, my brother, my oldest brother was the third case of measure 11 in the state when it was passed by voters in the, in the late 1990s. And I've witnessed firsthand just the barriers that he's faced time and time again. Um, he went to prison at, at, at a, he was 17 and now he's in his early forties. Uh, and I've just witnessed the barriers that he's faced. I wanna make sure we're reinvesting um, in alternative sentencing, et cetera, to make sure that we can, can shift the needle from incarceration to prevention and intervention. Um, I think additionally, when it comes to addiction services, you know, I, I firmly believe that, that my brother would have not been murdered and my dad would have not overdosed if they had the proper resources readily available to them. Um, you, when, when someone wants to get clean and sober, there's about a 48 hour window of opportunity for them to do so. But when you try to get a bed at a facility or, or, or get assistance, that, that window of opportunity is outside of that 48 hour mark. Uh, we need to be creative and innovative in ways that allows us to address solution driven, uh, alternatives for our community to access these resources. Uh, and that comes by way of making sure our corporations pay their fair share, reinvesting in, in the kicker and looking at other alternatives to, to increase taxes or, or revenue for the state. Um, you know, if elected, I'd be the first ever uh, Native American man elected to the Oregon legislature and first ever Native American gay man ele elected to the Oregon legislature. So my campaign is literally history in the making. Um, and I'm excited for the opportunity to serve House District 50. Great. Uh, thank you both. This was a really great conversation. We really appreciate the time and the thought that you put into preparing for this and, and, and talking with us today. Um, we will be making our endorsements, uh, I believe, this Sunday. Uh, so you can look for it then, but we'll follow up with any further questions. So thank you again. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time.